Hi everyone, in this video I'm going to talk about using the built-in scope function of the modular ECUs. Now all the modular ECUs have got a built-in scope capability and it's mainly to aid in diagnosis, especially in triggering, but it can also be used for tuning other things that happen very quickly. So let's start off with a bit of an introduction It's about what an oscilloscope is and what it's used for and how to use one. Now they used to be called a crow or cathode ray oscilloscope, they used old cathode ray tubes. So normally they would have two channels, so a separate probe for each and you may want to measure things down to millivolts or up to hundreds of volts. So you need a way to adjust the vertical scale of each channel. So normally the screens divide into divisions, so it's normally 8 or 10 vertical divisions and usually 10 horizontal divisions. And you choose the scale in terms of volts per division. Similarly you may want to see things that happen in the microsecond sort of time domain or things that happen over a period of hundreds of milliseconds. So again you need some way of adjusting the horizontal scaling uh, which is called the time base and that's in time per division so you know 100 milliseconds per division or you know 10 microseconds per division if you're looking for something that happens very quickly. So you can imagine that if you're looking at something like an injector pulse for example then the voltage will normally sit high at at battery voltage, so 14 volts or whatever, and then it will pulse low for the um, for the duration of the injector pulse, and then it'll it'll go back up high again. So you can see now why people call it a pulse width, which is a really silly name because it's really a pulse duration. But when you're looking at it on a crow screen, the duration is actually represented by the width of the pulse on the screen because the width is in time. So it's a bit of a silly term, but our industry is full of those. So sorry about that. So on our built-in scope you have four channels rather than just two and because it's all done in software inside the ECU you can actually look at multiple channels that don't actually correspond to voltages necessarily. So as well as looking at voltages like the crank angle sensor voltage inputs or analog sensor voltage inputs and that sort of thing, you can also look at the current engine angle, so where the ECU thinks the engine is within its 720 degree cycle or any of the calibrated variables such as our estimated manifold pressure or um, you know, estimated charge temperature or, or any other variable like that that you want to name. So let's pick an example which would probably be one of the most common um, which is looking at the crank angle sensor waveforms during a cranking condition. So most engines crank it around sort of 180 to 220 uh, revolutions per minute. So when you do the sums you work out that you actually want to capture about a second worth of information which means that your time base should be set to 100 milliseconds per division. So your 10 divisions across give you about a second of time. Now the channels that we want to see, the CAS1 voltage, so to select this you go to the select channels button then in the search term there you can type in CAS1, you can see the CAS1 voltage, so we'll choose that. And we'll also choose the CAS2 voltage. Another one that we'll choose is the current engine angle, so this is in degrees after top dead center of cylinder 1 with 0 being cylinder 1 TDC ignition. So it goes over a range of minus 360 to plus 360 and then starts again immediately at minus 360, representing the full 720 degree cycle. Okay, so we select those. Now since we don't actually know what the waveform looks like yet or what we want to use to trigger the screen, we'll just set it to automatic. So what that means is that the screen will be continually refreshing, so it'll always just show you the latest data uh, from the scope, but it won't actually be synchronized with anything. Now in terms of the vertical scale, remember I said before that we need to be careful of this. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to set CAS1 and CAS2 to be 1 volt per division, which is the default setting anyway, and the current engine angle will be 100 per division, which is 100 degrees per division so it should move over a range of um, 7.2 divisions from minus 3.6 to plus 3.6. Now this picture here actually um, I have to thank Sean Christensen from TurboSource in the US for this one. So this is a trigger that's set up correctly and if you've never looked at a reluctor waveform before on a, on a built-in scope or on a real scope this is what they look like. So as the tooth approaches the sensor the magnetic reluctance increases and that generates a positive voltage in the reluctor winding proportional to the rate of increase of the magnetic field strength. Then as the tooth actually passes the middle of the sensor the voltage actually goes back down to zero. Then as the tooth goes away from the sensor the voltage goes negative and then eventually comes back up to zero again. So to see this characteristic we can see on the CAS2 trace where the voltage starts at zero, goes high, goes down through zero and then goes back up to zero again. Now the point where it actually does what's called the negative zero crossing is actually where the tooth is lined up in the middle of the sensor. Now with the reluctor sensor, because it generates a voltage proportional to the rate of magnetic field strength change, that means that at zero RPM, so when the engine stopped, you don't see any voltage at all. 
regardless of whether the sensors lined up with the tooth or not. It also means that as the RPM increases, the voltage increases proportionally as well. So at 2000 RPM, you'll have double the signal compared to 1000 RPM. And that also means that at cranking, the signal is going to be quite low. Now, the first useful thing you can do here is you can actually see that the reluctor sensor has been wired up correctly. The fact that it goes positive first and then negative down through zero and then back up to zero tells us that the sensor is wired correctly. If the polarity were reversed on the sensor, then we'd actually see it uh, flipped vertically. So the voltage would be negative first of all, it would rise up through zero and then go back down to zero uh, from the positive side. Now this is a 2JZ GTE engine without variable valve timing. So it has one sensor on the camshaft, well it actually has two but in this example we're only showing one, and it has a sensor on the crankshaft. Now the crankshaft has got 12 teeth and they're evenly spaced, so every 30 degrees. Now because it's a multi-tooth trigger like that you don't actually see the individual pulses, you just see basically a sine wave. So you can't actually tell the polarity is correct from just looking at this in isolation, but I'll show you how you can actually do that. Now the other thing that you can notice is that the current engine angle here actually increases by 30 degrees every time the ECU sees a new tooth, that is a new zero crossing of the crank angle sensor. So this tells us that the EC is tracking as the engine rotates. Now one thing you should be able to see is that the negative zero crossing of the cam sensor happens basically lined up with the positive zero crossing of the crank sensor. So that's halfway in between the two negative uh, crossings. So what that means is that the cam can actually move around by up to 15 crank degrees either side and the ordering of the zero crossings will not change. If the camshaft actually moved by 20 crank degrees then the first crank tooth after the cam reset would actually be a different tooth and then the calculated timing and the engine would jump by 30 degrees. So that's one thing that you have to be careful when you're setting up a crank and a cam combined system like that is how tolerant is it of your relative change to the cam angle. Now the factory actually set it up pretty well because they know what they're doing but I've seen a lot of aftermarket triggers that are not that well set up at all. Especially when you go to higher tooth counts. See, 12 teeth on the crank means every 30 degrees, so that's very tolerant of, of misalignment. But when people start to put 36 teeth crank, 36 teeth crank trigger wheels on, so it's every 10 degrees, if you don't have some way of resetting it off the crankshaft, then it's very easy for the camshaft to move by you know, five degrees relative to the crank over the full rev range of the engine. So um, you have to be careful about that sort of thing. But again, this is the sort of thing that you can see with the, with the built-in scope. Now the other thing is of course that if the negative zero crossing of the crank and the cam were lined up so that they happened almost together then that would tell you in this case that the crank sensor has been wired incorrectly and the polarity should be inverted and that way the zero crossing of the cam would fall halfway in between uh, the two crank triggers and everyone would be happy again. Now there is also a time when the cam shaft can move relative to the crank and that's by design and that's called a variable valve timing engine. So you'll notice that on most variable valve timing engines they'll have a higher number of teeth on the crank but they'll have some missing teeth and the ECU will get its top dead center reference from the missing teeth rather than from the cam shaft. Now another thing that I mentioned earlier which I sort of glossed over is that the voltage output of a reluctor sensor varies proportionally with RPM. So if you look at say a six cylinder engine if it's just cranking and not firing up and going nye, 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 then each nye is caused by the engine speed slowing down and speeding up as each cylinder does its compression stroke. So you'll have six nyes per cam revolution for obvious reasons. And so if you actually look at the crank angle sensor waveform, you'll see the amplitude will change. You'll actually have six little bumps corresponding to the speed change. If you take all the spark plugs out of the engine so there's no compression, and you crank it, it'll just go re no compression at all and the waveform will be completely constant in amplitude. Now if you just wanted a free running scope that just gave you a basic idea of what's going on, then that's really all you need to know with setting it up. So um, have fun with that. But um, sometimes you want to see things actually happening synchronously with some other event. So for example, if you've got a variable valve timing engine, then you might want to be able to advance and retard the camshafts and actually watch the waveforms move relative to the crank waveform. So if you wanted to do that, then you could set it up the same way that we said before, except we're gonna set up the trigger on the scope now. So where I think would be a good place to trigger it would be off the current engine angle crossing zero degrees because that's cylinder one TDC ignition. So if you have that in the center of the screen, then the crank waveform should look pretty much the same at constant RPM. But as you move the camshafts back and forward, then uh, you'll see those pulses move. 
So to set up the trigger, you go back to the, um, the button to select the channels and the trigger mode. And again, we're going to use the search. We'll look for current engine angle. Then we'll click the bottom right arrow to bring the current engine angle into the list of trigger channels. We'll select that one and we'll change the mode to be normal rising edge. We'll set the threshold to zero. And that means that as the engine passes TDC for cylinder one ignition, that will represent wherever we've got the horizontal offset set to. So by default, that's set to zero, meaning the middle of the screen. And so that means that the middle of the screen will be TDC of number one ignition. And then after that, you can just run it and you can move the cams and um, watch the move. Now, the other thing you can do is you can move that horizontal position uh, depending on what you're trying to see. So if you're trying to see something that happens in response to an event that you can measure, so for example, if you want to look at what happens with manifold pressure and RPM in response to a throttle input, what you do is you'd put the trigger all the way on the left, so minus four divisions. So you've still got one division before it happened to, to give you some context. And then you would set the trigger channel to be throttle position or pedal position or whatever you like, and set the threshold to be say five for five percent. And then when you press the throttle to more than five percent, that'll trigger the scope and you'll be able to see what happens for the next nine divisions after that, whatever you've set your time base to. So that's useful for that sort of thing. The other thing you can do is if you want to see what happens before an event which you can trigger off, for example, if you've got a, a trigger error that you're trying to catch, what you could do is you could set the trigger to be based off the um, trigger error count and set that to a number which it's going to hit like say five and then put the horizontal position all the way to the right. And then your channels would be you, you know, your CAS inputs and your um, current engine angle and that sort of thing. And then it would actually record that period of time before the trigger error happens or before the trigger error count reaches five. And that's what you'd see on the screen. So obviously to do this, it doesn't have a crystal ball inside. What it's doing is that it's always recording. And then when it gets to the trigger that you want, then it just reads the last bit after that, depending on how much there is to the screen to the right and that allows you to see all sorts of useful things. Now, this is a bit of an, a more advanced area here, which is how much can we actually work out from looking at a built-in scope waveform. So this is an example that Sean Christian from TurboSource in the US sent in. And this is actually what happens if you have a VVT Toyota 2J engine, but the ECU is set up for the non-VVT type trigger. So the VVT engine has got 36 teeth on the crank with two missing and it's got three teeth on the cam. Now, it might not be obvious unless you've actually played with these um, different trigger systems before and seen what happens if you don't do it this way. But the reason why they have the missing teeth on the crank is because the cam actually moves by up to about 60 degrees. So you can't use that as the reset to tell the ECU where top dead center is, because if you did, then as soon as the cam moved across to a different tooth, which is only 10 crank degrees apart, then the timing would jump and you'd be back to where you were. You wouldn't, you wouldn't know which tooth you were on, basically. So you either need another single tooth reset on the crank, or the easy way to do it is just have a missing tooth that saves you another sensor, saves the wiring, blah, 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 blah. So let's have a look at what we can learn from this scope waveform. So first of all, if there are 36 teeth on the crank with two missing, then each one corresponds to 10 degrees, right? 360 divided by 36. However, in this case, we see that the current engine angle is jumping up by 30 degrees each time, about a third of a division rather than a tenth of a division, right? So we know straight away that the settings in the ECU are wrong. Now, another thing is that remember that the ECU is triggered off the negative zero crossing with a reluctor type waveform. So in the case of a, a missing tooth, we need to make sure that um, during the missing tooth gap, we don't have a negative crossing in the middle of it, because if we do, then the ECU is actually looking at the spaces instead of the, um, the teeth, and that means that it's seeing a, a trigger in the middle of the gap, which is not what we want. And we can see in this waveform that the polarity is, has been wired correctly, because it goes up slowly up through zero, not slowly down through zero. So one tooth will be here at the, zero, the negative zero crossing before the gap, and the next tooth is there, the zero crossing after the gap, and the ECU is happy. Well, it's not happy because the trigger settings aren't correct, but at least the, the wiring's correct on the sensor though. And you can also see that the polarity of the cam sensor is correct as well, because it goes positive first, and then negative, and then back to zero. Now, the thing that I mentioned before about the reluctor voltage being proportional to engine speed, you can actually learn a fair bit about what the engine's doing just from looking at the amplitude of the signal in this case. So you can see, I mean, you all would know that when you have a misconfigured ignition system and the ECU fires the ignition at the wrong time during cranking, it can you know, stall the engine or the engine slows down a lot during that time. And you can see here where the amplitude is dropped really quickly. I mean, there's no missing teeth there. It's just slowed down and the spacing between the teeth has increased in the time domain, 
but also the amplitudes reduced, and that just tells you that the engine's slowed down a lot because the ignition's been fired at the wrong time. Now you can also see around the area here where there's the missing teeth that there's no real amplitude change, which is what tells us that that's actually genuinely a missing tooth rather than the engine slowed down enough for that time to spread out. Now the thing that's confusing the ECU is of course the settings being incorrect. So you can see that the current engine angle is jumping up by 30 degrees each crank tooth instead of 10 degrees. Secondly, you can see a jump in the engine angle at this point and there's a missing tooth gap there and the engine angle doesn't increase during that time, but it doesn't do anything with that like, um, like go back to top dead sander or, or anything like that. So that's why there's a jump in the engine angle there because of those missing teeth. If you didn't have the missing teeth, it might actually look like a nice staircase because you've still got one cam tooth for every 12 crank teeth. It's just coincidentally that there's 36 versus 12 on the crank and three versus one on the cam. But so in that case, the RPM would be three times as high as it, as it is really. And of course the ignition would be completely at the wrong time. So as well as the current engine angle and looking for jumps in that, which is a, a clear sign that you've got a trigger problem. There's also two other variables which you may find useful. One of them is trigger error angle and the other is trigger error counter. So the way it works is that the ECU, when it gets a, um, a new position fix, like from a, you know, a cam reset or a missing tooth on the crank or something like that, then the ECU knows what the next angle on the crank should be because it knows what the pattern is for this engine. However, if it didn't get that reset event, it could still work it out from knowing what the previous tooth was and counting from there. So normally what the ECU does is it would just look at the new value which it's learned. But um, what we've made it do now is it actually calculates what the next value would be. It compares that to the, the next value that it knows from the reset event. So the difference between those two should be zero. If it's not zero, that means that we've either got an extra tooth triggered somewhere because of interference or we've missed out a tooth because it wasn't big enough to trigger the sensor properly or the air gut was too small or something like that. But normally that value should be zero. Now the other thing is whenever that value is non-zero, it actually increases a trigger error counter. So that's set to minus one when the engine stopped, so it'll just display a dash on the screen. Normally that will go to either zero or one when the ECU first synchronizes with the engine, because obviously where it starts, it's, it doesn't know where it is. And then after that, it should stay at that value, either zero or one. Now, if it keeps increasing after that, then that means that each one of those increases is because of a trigger event that's happened, a trigger error that's happened. So as I said before, you can use that trigger error counter to trigger the scope, and that way you can actually see what's happened. And that's a lot more useful than just trying to watch the scope all the time to look for a, you know, a one in a hundred chance that there's a trigger error. Now, I mentioned before that the built-in scope can be used for watching all kinds of things, not just trigger events and trigger inputs. So I'm going to show you another example now, which is where I was testing how quickly an electronic throttle body was moving. So what I did was I've um, selected the channels as being the pedal position input, the actual throttle position sensor, the engine speed, and the manifold pressure. So you can see that the engine speed's updated every crank revolution, so it looks a little bit blocky at low RPM. But you can see that this is every, um, one division here is 25 milliseconds. And what I've done is I've actually triggered the scope from the pedal position input. So what you can see is it actually takes me about 50 milliseconds for me to actually put the pedal from all the way up to all the way down. And it takes about the same time for the throttle motor to move, and that's about 25 milliseconds delayed from the pedal movement. So if anyone complains about how laggy electronic throttles are, I don't think it's due to the hardware, considering that it actually responds faster than you can move the pedal, at least according to data in, in, in this example. So I mean, in this case, obviously the solution is to tell the driver to put his foot down faster, which is me in this case. Now, of course you can use the built-in scope for triggering all kinds of things. It's really a general purpose, very high speed data logger. That's really the purpose of it. A lot of these things you won't see with enough resolution with a normal data log, so you can use it. And it's also faster to see it live. You can tap the pedal and watch it change on the screen live in front of you. And the main thing is that you need some way of triggering it so that the ECU actually knows what it is that you're trying to see. Okay, so the main point is that you can use this for monitoring anything, really, so long as that you've got a, some way of triggering it, so you, you've got some way of telling it what you want to see. So, for example, the last example I gave, which is looking at how fast the throttle moves in response to a pedal position input. You could use that to trigger the scope to watch the asynchronous injection pulse, for example. So you can see how quickly that occurs after pressing the pedal. Another example would be you could look at the engine's response as 
it's coming back down to idle. What you do is you'd set RPM as your trigger and set the threshold to be you know, 1000 RPM or something and then make it a falling edge trigger instead of a rising edge trigger. And that way when it falls through 1000 RPM that would actually trigger the scope and you'd be able to look at you know, what the idle valve is doing, what the RPM is doing, what the manifold pressure is doing and that sort of thing. And you can use it for lots of other high speed events like watching the manifold pressure change as each cylinder does its intake stroke or you can use it for looking at things like how the RPM gets affected as the thermo fans or air conditioner turn on and off uh, to fine tune those. Really it's, it's a very powerful tool and it's something that we're very happy to have in all our modular series. Thank you very much.